Uh, so we're talking about leading children in revival. Let's look at Matthew chapter 25, verse 1 to 12. It says, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps, but took no oil with them. The wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made out, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. All the virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. The wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there not be enough for us and you, but go rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. I always say it, it must have been Walmart they went to because it was midnight. Uh, but um, while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterwards came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, open unto us. But he answered, saying, Verily I say unto you, I know ye not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your presence here today, Father. I thank you for each and every person that's here, each and every church that's represented, Father, each and every city and state and country, Father. And we just thank you, Father, for, for starting a fire, continuing a fire that's already going in the hearts of these people, Father, and changing us. I thank you, Father, that when we leave this place at the end of this week, we'll all be different. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Hallelujah. The Bible says here it, it um, am I doing something wrong with the microphone? Is it something I'm doing? Or? Anyway, we'll try it out here. In this parable here, the church represents, I'm sorry, the ten virgins represent who? The church. And the bridegroom represents who? Jesus. So we have here an illustrated sermon, if you will, of the relationship between Jesus and the church. And I know us macho men don't like to think of it that way, but we are the bride of Christ. And the, pur the, the purpose of this parable, in other words, all the parables have a purpose, all the teachings of Jesus have a purpose. The purpose is to explain something about our relationship with the Lord. Now, if you just stop and think about it, the relationship that we have as the church with the Lord is similar to that of a bride who's waiting to get married. Do we have any, uh, any engaged people here or young couples, people just recently married over here? Okay, come on up here. Your name is Richard, is that right? Nice to meet you. Okay. Shannon, okay, Shannon. One more time. Shannon, am I saying that? Sharon, okay, I'm sorry. So, you must be from Texas. Something like that. Scotland, okay. All right, Richard and Sharon. Now, let's just, uh, how long have you guys been married? Three and a half weeks. Wow. <laughs> Praise God. Now, this is a honeymoon. Not quite. Not quite, yeah. Well, let's go back in time, say, a couple months. Let's just imagine that I came up to Sharon and I said, Sharon, are you excited about marrying Richard? Yes. Now, of course, she says yes, and that's what you would expect. But let's just imagine that she had a different response. Let's just imagine that a couple months ago, I asked her, are you excited about getting married? And she said, ah, no big deal. You know, he's just a guy. He's, you know, I mean, I could take him or leave him kind of thing. You would think, well, Sharon's not ready to get married. Amen? Which, of course, you know, that's not their relationship. But... I, I use this illustration to point out the kind of relationship that we are to have with the Lord, which is a relationship of passion. Amen? 
and I don't mean this in the wrong way, but Jesus is not coming back for Sunday morning Christians. He's not coming back for people that the only reason they go to church is to fulfill some little guilty obligation. Now, what would you think, Richard, if after you got married, Sharon said, you know, I love you, Richard, but we can only kiss once a week. Oh. Except, except in the summer. In the summer, we're going to the lake, so we won't kiss at all, you know. Uh, and, uh, yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, but that's how much of what we call Christians, the body of Christ is. They, you know, they're, they're not passionate in their relationship with Jesus. It's just, it's just meeting a, uh, a, some sort of religious obligation. Thank you, Richard and Sharon. God bless you guys. But Jesus is coming back soon. When? I don't know when. I'm not going to set a date. Because he told us not to worry about dates. But he did tell us to be ready. Amen? Now, whatever you think about when he's coming... I do know this, it's scriptural to be ready today. It's scriptural to be passionate, on fire for Jesus today. Because he could come back today. Amen? Now, you know, every time a deliverer came, there were two deliverers, primary deliverers that we see in the Bible. One was Moses, and the other was Jesus. And right before Moses came, there was an attack where the, where the leaders, the government, started killing all the baby boys. And right, right after Jesus was born, the devil slaughtered all the babies, everybody under two. Why does the devil pick on two-year-olds? Because he's a wimp. He didn't want to deal with a full-grown anointed Jesus. He knew there was a deliverer coming, and so he's thinking, boy, if I can kill this deliverer when he's two, I don't have to mess with him. But you know what? When I see the devil killing kids like he is today, you know what that tells me? There's a deliverer coming! So he could come today. But it's scriptural that we be passionate. He's coming back for a church that's red hot and on fire for him. Now here's something else. He's not just coming back for a church of old people. Heaven is a place for kids. It's a place for teenagers. You know, you think about it. Heaven is teenager heaven. Now just think about this. There's no nighttime in heaven. You don't have to come home. Mom says be home before dark. You can stay out all night. It's teenager heaven. Amen? It's heaven for parents because up in heaven, we don't have to worry about them getting on drugs. Amen? It's heaven for kids. You know, in heaven it says they worship God 24 hours a day. Now, who do you think's leading that worship? It's the teenagers. Us old fogies don't have that much energy. It's the kids and the teenagers. You know, you see the, the, the emotion and the passion that's released at a lot of these rock concerts? It's just misplaced praise. All that energy that we see happening there is designed to be poured out for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And so if that's true, if Jesus is coming back for a church of not just, you know, you know what we call, and I'm including myself in this, old people, but he's coming back for a church of, of, of kids, of teenagers, of parents and grandparents, then, it's, then we know that it's possible for our children to be passionately in love with Jesus. It's not going to be where every Sunday we've got to say, okay, now sit up. 
shut up, don't talk. I'm going to give you candy if you don't, you know. There's a higher place. Amen? There's a higher place. Now, we just got done, I say just got done, it, I'm talking July, with, we did four camps for kids, four summer camps back to back. Each camp lasted four days. We ran 500 kids through our summer camps. And, and the primary focus of the camp was the evening revival services. That's what it was all about. Those services lasted, you know, sometimes three, four hours. John was one of our speakers there. And those kids, you know, it, we just started doing this because God said to do it. And I'm still wondering, is this going to work, you know? Because we're not doing a whole lot of stuff. But we had, you know, one of the camps, we had about 200 kids there. As soon as the worship leader started hit the keyboard, the kids just took over. They just took over, didn't they, Brother John? Second session of camp, they just took over. They just went running and dancing and shouting. I'm just sitting at the back just watching them, just weeping. They just took over. You know, I'm seeing things with kids that I've never seen before. Now, as I'm watching this, God began to speak to me about some things about our ministry, and he specifically told me that he wants me to gather large groups of children, not hundreds, but thousands. Gather large groups of children together to worship him. And you know what? This isn't something I'm doing for myself because it's a ministry project. It's not even something I'm doing for the kids. It's something I'm doing for Jesus. Because he, because he wants me to do that. He likes it when kids worship him. And the devil doesn't like it. Now, several years ago, 1995, was when I, uh, I was pastoring a church, senior pastor at a church in Sarnia, Ontario, Canada, which is kind of near Detroit, Michigan area. I was pastor at this church, and at that time in my life, I'd been ministering to kids for 16 years, and I'm going to use this word that I don't really like, but I was burned out on it. I've been doing it for a long time, and I was tired. I was burned out, and I just had this attitude. I don't want to do this anymore, God. And I don't really like the word burned out, because really it's, we should say, backslid. We say burned out because it sounds like it's someone else's fault. But I don't, you know, I wouldn't admit it back then, but I was backslid. Now, when I say backslid, I don't mean that I was an adulterer or anything like that. But I'm just talking about my relationship with God was not one of fire. It wasn't one of passion. There was a time in my life where I was much more in love with Jesus than I was at that point. And I was, I was tired of it and I was burned out on it. And so I decided, well, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm going to be a senior pastor at a church. And I'm just, I'm just tired of doing this. So I took this little struggling church in Sarnia, Ontario, Canada. It was a church that had, had one split after another split. And they had voted out the two pastors before me in a period of about six months. And yet God was sending me there. And I thought he loved me, you know. <laughs> and, and to be honest, it was a real difficult time ministry-wise. It was one of the hardest times in my life ministry-wise. But there was, a, there was a couple hours from there, there was a revival happening at a church in Toronto. And just out of sheer desperation, out of sheer hunger, uh, I started going to this revival in Toronto, and I got addicted. I had, you know, I'd drive there two hours, two hours and 20 minutes there, and be there till midnight and drive two hours and 20 minutes back. They say the church that's alive is worth the drive, but, you know, this was getting ridiculous. But what happened during that time, even though my ministry was hard, is I began to push into a personal relationship with God that I had never experienced before. And so my relationship with God grew by leaps and bounds during that time. Well, I'm pastor of this church, and, but I'd still minister at kids' camps from time to time. And I was ministering at this kids' camp at a church in Fergus Falls, Minnesota. We were in this dirty old building. There was, it was the basement of a, 
of the lodge. And there was, you know, cement blocks and, and it was, you know, kind of mildewy down there and wasn't very pretty. There was about 75 kids there. And I was doing my normal routine of what I used to do. And I still do some of this, but I was very much involved in, you know, uh, changing what I did every five minutes. And, 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 and there is attention spans. It's, it, it's, it's uh, a reality to a certain extent of kids. But, you know, when, when revival happens, the Holy Ghost can override attention spans. Amen? When the anointing's there, that can override attention spans. And so I had all my puppets and object lessons and all the props and all the things that I had, and I had set up my puppet stage, and I'm getting everything organized and got my list and, you know, checking it, and, and worship had started, and I'm finishing up my list. And then when I got done, I just sat down behind the puppet stage, and I was waiting for worship to end for, them, for the children's pastor to introduce me and me to do my thing that I did. And I'm just sitting there waiting behind the puppet stage, and the, the worship band was a group of teenagers. It was basically the youth group worship band was leading the worship. And I can see them from the corner of my eye over here. But in front of me, all I can see is blue, a blue curtain. <laughs> and I'm just sitting there waiting. And as I'm waiting, I felt something all of a sudden. I couldn't see a thing, but I felt what were like waves of power coming through the puppet stage. And I thought to myself, something's going on out there. But I couldn't see anything. So I stood up and I just kind of peeked out from behind the puppet stage to see what was going on. Now, I always taught my puppet team kids, you know, that's kind of a sin in puppet land, you know, to look out from behind the puppet stage. <laughs> but um, none of them were there with me that night, you know. And... Uh, <laughs> I thought the Lord would forgive me. Peeked out from behind the puppet stage to see what's going on out there. And I saw a sight I'll never forget. And this was kind of what started me on my journey, if you will. Where God began to change me and change my ministry. Was I looked out there and I saw 75 kids. Every child had their hands lifted up. Some of them were on their knees up at the front, you know, just weeping and tears coming down their faces, just worshiping Jesus passionately. And as I looked at them, I thought, you know, I've never seen kids worship like this. It was just it was passionate worship. It was so strong that I felt it without seeing it. That's how strong it was. And I just wanted, I just thought, man, I'd just like to, you know, just stay here forever. Because the church I was pastoring... The people didn't worship very well. It was a church, you know, there was so much hurt in the people. They'd come in church, and instead of, you know, being on revival, they had their guard up because they'd been hurt so much. And the worship leader would get up there and start worship and be playing the piano, and the people would just sit there like a bump on a log. And then after church was over with, people would, they'd sort of complain and say, you know, worship wasn't anointed today. Well, try singing. It's more anointed when you sing. Try dancing. Try shouting. You know what? That's what it's all about is participation. It's not up to the leader to bring in the presence of God. They're there to help us and they have a gift and all of that. But, but it's, it's the corporate worship that brings in the power. And as I'm watching these kids and thinking about the people that I'm pastoring back in Ontario, I'm thinking, you know, I'd like to just back up a truck, lift up this whole building, drive it to Canada, and say, because here was this group of teenagers, just, you know, 15, 16-year-old kids leading this worship, and those, these, you know, 7, 8, 9, 10-year-old kids just worshiping Jesus passionately, and God was there in power. And I just wanted to show the people to say, this is how you do it. It's not hard. It's really not. Now, was there something special about those kids in Minnesota? Or can every child learn how to worship God like that? It's for everybody. Amen? It's for everybody. Anybody that wants to have that can have that. 
can press in for that. Amen? And so, Jesus is coming back for that kind of church. A passionate church. And it includes our teenagers. It includes our kids. And so that's what we're talking about. Really, when we're talking about leading kids in revival, we're talking about leading kids into a love relationship with Jesus, into a passionate relationship with Jesus. Now, we, are, we do see the different manifestations, and I thank God for that, but that's not what it's all about. What it's all about is our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and being passionate in that relationship. Now, the first thing that I, that I need to do if I want to lead kids in revival is I need to be in revival myself. Amen? I can't lead kids in revival if I'm not in revival. Now, I just want to, I'm going to read a couple things about just a couple stories from the history of revival. You know, when you say the words children's ministry today, we all think of different things. Some people may, may think of clowns, crafts, cookies, Kool-Aid, coloring pictures, puppets, all these different things that we think of children's ministry. And, and those are all tools. And I don't believe there's anything wrong with any of them. I've used all those tools. But you know what? They're secondary. They're secondary to revival. They're secondary to the move of God. They're secondary to teaching our kids to be passionate in their worship. But I'm just trying to say that in, in the 20th century, especially in American culture, when you say the words children's ministry, that's what 90% of people think of, is those kinds of things. But it hasn't always been that way. If you look at the history of revival, kids and teenagers were always right in the middle of it. And so I'm just going to read a couple little stories here from, from well, two different revivals. One was uh, there was a revival at Cane Ridge, August 6th through 9th, 1801. It was a mighty outpouring of the Spirit of God in, in Kentucky in a place called Cane Ridge. It was one of America's first camp meetings, and it's considered by many to be the most important revival in American history. Now, this is a little excerpt from an eyewitness at that revival, and this is what he says. Although only ministers preached prepared sermons, literally hundreds of people became spontaneous exhorters, excitedly giving spiritual advice or cheerful warnings. Almost anyone, small children, slaves, the shy, the illiterate, could exhort with great effect. One seven-year-old girl mounted a man's shoulders and spoke wondrous words until she was completely fatigued. When she lay her hand, head on his as if to sleep, someone in the audience suggested that the poor thing had better be laid down to rest. The girl roused and said, don't call me, I love this. She roused and said, don't call me poor, for Christ is my brother, God is my father, I have a kingdom to inherit, therefore do not call me poor, for I'm rich in the blood of the lamb. Now that does not sound like a seven-year-old to me. That sounds like the Holy Ghost. Now, in Great Britain, Scotland, Ireland, England, there was a revival from 1859 to 1863. And in that revival, God began to use the kids in a powerful way. Here's one story. On Friday the 10th of June, 1859, in Northern Ireland, there was a schoolboy under such deep conviction of sin he could not concentrate on his work. His teacher suggested he ought to go home and pray by himself and allow another boy who had only been converted the day before to accompany him. On their way, they passed an empty house and stopped to pray inside where the boy came right through to an assurance of salvation. Immediately, he insisted on returning to school and announcing, I'm so happy I have the Lord Jesus in my heart. Now, here's a schoolboy that it just announces about his, his... And you know that if, if what he said had an impact, which it did, because it says what he said, it says this affected the whole school in turn. So he didn't just stand up and say, Oh, I love Jesus. There had to be some passion in what he was saying. There had to be an anointing on what he was saying if it affected the whole school. But God used this young schoolboy to affect the whole school. 
One by one, boys quietly slipped out of the classroom and were seen kneeling by themselves around the playground, praying silently. The teacher asked the first boy who had been converted if he'd go out and pray for them. When he began to pray for their forgiveness, they broke into a bitter cry which penetrated the school so that the boys remaining inside dropped to their knees and began to cry for mercy. Same thing happened in the girls' school, which was upstairs. Holy Ghost even reached the girls. Now, I love this part. Parents who called in to collect their children were converted on the spot. Now, you know, a hundred years ago, God could do that, but he can't do that today. Ministers were sent for to help counsel, and the school was not finally cleared until 11 p.m. that night. That's the Holy Ghost to keep kids in school till 11 p.m. Amen? I'm going to switch microphones. So the Holy Ghost has moved on kids powerfully in past revivals. And he's moving powerfully today. But if I'm going to lead kids there, I've got to be there myself. That's the first step for leading kids in revival is to be in a revival yourself. And why, the reason that this is so important is because children learn by imitation. In fact, we all do. I, you know how I learned to worship God when I first got saved? I learned to worship God by watching other people. I don't know about you, but the first time I walked in the charismatic church, I didn't look around and go, oh, wow, this is great. I didn't do that. I didn't even get saved the first time. It took about six months. But I learned to worship by watching other people. So we're all influenced, but children especially are influenced. One church, actually the first church I began to work at, which was in a city in Port Huron, Michigan, when we started out, we were pioneering a church, and we didn't have uh, a nursery. We had children's church and, and preschool, but we didn't have nursery. And so all the babies sat with their parents in the service. And this one Sunday morning, we had what I call, you know, a revival service or a Holy Ghost blowout type service. There were people slain in the Spirit, laid out all over the place. And this one mom told me the story that after that service, her daughter, who was two and a half years old and sat throughout the whole service and watched everything, went home after church on Sunday afternoon and gathered her dolls from all around the house. She took these dolls up into her bedroom and went by and laid hands on each one of these dolls. And when she did, she, and prayed for them. And when, after she got done praying for these dolls, she knocked them over on the floor. And then she went by and put little hankies over their dresses. <laughs> now, what was she doing? She was imitating. Some people think, oh, you know, they're mocking the Holy Ghost. No, they're not. See, their play is what's serious to them. And, you know, it, even if they are imitating, if, the, you know, if you just let them do it, they'll slip into the real thing. Amen? In, in Pastor Van's book on children and revival, there's a story in there, and I may have the details wrong, Van, but, but uh, I, I think I'll tell it pretty close. But there's a story in there about one of the preschool classes at Brownsville where this little boy showed up, little preschooler, five years old, showed up and just announced to the rest of the kids in the class, he said, I'm the preacher tonight. I'm Steve Hill. Now, all these little guys, I don't know why, but they all listened to him. He said, get over here, I'm going to preach to you. So they all got over there. He preached about a, you know, two-minute sermon. He, sh he put his Bible down and said, okay, now I'm going to pray for you. You guys all line up. Again, they all, you know, these little preschools, they all listened to him. He went by and laid hands on each one of these kids, and every one of them fell over. Now, here's the amazing thing. They laid there for an hour. Now, I don't know about you. I don't know if you've ever taught preschoolers. But they don't lay there for an hour. Brother John, last night I was talking about the reward that we have for giving a little guy a cup of cool, cold, cold water. The reward we get if we give a little child a cup of cold water. There must be an incredible reward for taking four-year-old boys to the bathroom.
Think about it. There's nothing more trying than taking four of your boys to the bathroom. A group of them. I don't mean one. I mean a group of them. But they don't lay there for an hour, little preschoolers, except by the Holy Ghost. Amen? So I need to be in revival myself. If I want my kids to be in a revival, I need to be in a revival. Now, in closing here, I'm just going to take a few minutes and just tell you my own personal testimony. Because it's impossible for me to be in a revival, or to lead kids in revival if I'm not in revival. And I already shared a little bit about it, uh, about my, the condition that I was in, how I was burned out when I took the, the pastor of that church in Canada. And I was kind of like this orange. Now this orange, and I think there's a lot of Christians today that are like this. This orange, there's good fruit on the inside of this orange. But if I were to take a bite of it like this, it doesn't taste very good. Why? There's a, there's a hard skin on the outside of this orange, and it's bitter. So to get to the good fruit, I've got to get rid of this hard skin. Now, when I say I was like this, I was at a point in my life where I thought I was a good person. I didn't drink, I didn't smoke, and I didn't kick cats. <laughs> I didn't do none of that. Not only that, but I was going all over the country and all over the world preaching and getting people saved and filled with the Holy Ghost, and I was doing a lot of good things. But over the years, there was a hardness about me that I didn't know was there. Now, I guess, you know, if I'd asked Van, I would have known. <laughs> Isn't it amazing how other people, it doesn't take long to figure out what people's weaknesses are. People think it's discerning of spirits. No, I mean, you know, lots of unsaved people can figure out what your weaknesses are. We all got weaknesses and we all got problems, you know, and, but there was a hardness about me. There was good fruit inside me. My heart was right in the sense that I loved God and I'd given my life to him and all that, you know, but there was a hardness. There was a judgmentalism towards other people. There were, there were pride issues in my life that I didn't even know were there and that God wanted to get rid of them. Now, in Luke chapter 3, verse 16, it says, He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And I knew what that Holy Ghost thing was. I'd been baptized in water. I'd been baptized in the Holy Ghost and spoken in other tongues. But I wasn't real sure about this baptism in fire. What is that? Is that where the pastor stands you on a, you know, a charcoal grill and dips you down in the hot coals? Or what is this baptism in fire? And I wasn't sure about that, and so I sort of stayed away from this scripture. But one thing about fire is it can be a blessing or a destroyer. If you're in the right place with God and fire comes, it's a blessing. If you're not, it's a destroyer. Now let me just say this, though. God doesn't destroy you. But he does want to destroy things about you that are displeasing to him. And it might be things that are real dear to you. It might be things that you hold on to that are really important to you, and God wants to burn it up. And it's going to be probably different things for different people. So what happened to me was I went to this revival meeting in Toronto. Now, this was a big step for me. You know why? Because it wasn't my group. It was a different group. And I, I had just read about this revival in Charisma magazine, and there were people flying there from England all over the place, and I just thought, well, if they're flying there from England, I can drive two hours and 20 minutes and see what's happening. But it was hard for me to go there because it wasn't my group, and I didn't know anything about them, and I, and I just heard all these wild stories. I remember getting out of my van and grabbing my Bible and thinking to myself, I hope they use the Bible here. Because I didn't know. Now, they did. They did preach the Bible there. They did preach the word there. But I didn't know. I was just, I was, and, 
I was just real tentative. And then they had pastors they, at the end of the service during ministry time. They said, we want to pray for the pastors first. So I went up there and they, they had a ministry team, several, I don't know, maybe 30, 40 different people trained to pray for people and minister to people. And the fellow that prayed for me was somebody named Bill. Now, what was different there and, and what I'd seen in most Pentecostal services was where the, the evangelists would go by and lay hands on people for about, you know, two seconds and just keep moving. But they stayed with people a long time. Now, up to that point in my life, I had never been slain in the spirit or fallen under the power or rested in the spirit or whatever you want to call it. That had never happened to me. I'd never fallen down when being prayed for. Quite frankly, I never got prayed for very much. To be honest with you. Well, I went forward to be prayed for, and Bill didn't just pray for like 30 seconds. He prayed for about 10, 15 minutes. And the more he prayed, something began to happen. I began to get dizzy. It was kind of like going to the dentist and getting laughing gas. I just became sort of like queasy, kind of, you know, detached from the rest of the world, sort of as he's praying for me. It got more that way. And then all of a sudden, as he's praying for me, I started to fall forward like this, which I'd never seen anybody do that. And I thought, well, what is this, new doctrine? You know, I mean. And um, so I pulled myself back because I didn't want to fall forward. And as I pulled myself back, I started to fall back. And so I kind of did this for a while. And eventually, I just collapsed on the ground. Some people say, why do they fall down? Well, the simple answer is they can't stand up. And I fell down, and, and I laid there. And then I started, after about five minutes, I, you know, I put the palms of my hands on the ground and started to push myself up. And Bill came back over and laid hands on my shoulder, and I fell down again. You know, not very far that time, you know, just... I started to get up again. Bill came, you know, they were tricky like that. They, <laughs> they wanted you to stay down there. So I just sort of laid there and thought, well, God, if this is you, I'll just lay here and... And when I finally gave up fighting it, God just began to deal with me about things. And I didn't shake. I didn't laugh. I didn't cry. I didn't do anything like that. I just laid there. And, but everything that happened to me was on the inside of me. And I left that place changed. And God began to rip out things that were there that I didn't even know were there. One was, first thing he talked about was my worship. Because I never got loud in my worship. I never shouted. never just went, Hallelujah! I love you, Jesus! I never did that. I liked quiet worship. In fact, my favorite worship scripture was, Be still and know that I am God. I just thought, well, there's people that like to shout. There's people that like to dance. But I don't like to do this stuff. I just like quiet. Now, the funny thing was, though, I'd shout at the football game. But at church, it's not my personality. <laughs> or it's not my culture. Well, when you get saved, you change nationalities. <laughs> when we get saved, we all turn black. <laughs> In our worship. We get free. Well, God said to me, you know why you don't shout? And I said, now when God asks you a question, it's not because he doesn't know the answer. <laughs> it's a setup. I said, why, God? Why do I not shout? He said, because of pride. You're concerned about what other people think. You don't want to bring attention to yourself. And you know what? He was right. I knew that he was right. And, you know, when people talk to you, you know, if Van had talked to me, I would have had lots of excuses. But when the Holy Ghost talks to you, you know he's right. And then he asked me another question. He said, you know why you don't dance? Another setup. 
I said, why, God? He said, because of pride. You're concerned about what other people think. Then he talked to me about my attitudes towards other Christians. First he talked to me about my attitude towards him. I didn't realize how pride was actually hindering my relationship with God. Now men deal with this more than women do. I notice that when kids are about two, they're really free in their worship. Boys and girls. You put on an upbeat praise song, and they'll just start dancing. Kids don't know not to dance in church until an adult tells them not to. But the older they get, the boys get more reserved. The girls will go for it, and the boys will hold back in most places that I go to when they get to, like, the elementary age. And I wonder why that is. I think maybe, just an idea, maybe the boys are that way because their dads are that way. Just a thought. It's not a prophecy, just a thought. And so... The first thing he talked to me about, I, I realized that pride was hindering me in my relationship with God and my love and my passion for Jesus. It was holding me back. And that's why that Holy Ghost fire had to come and burn it up. Next thing he talked to me about was my attitude towards other Christians, other believers, and other groups, other denominations. It's interesting that God had to send me to a different group, and there was a reason in that. Because I began to open up and I began to see that you know, I thought, and we all think this way, we think that our group is the right one. Amen? We have the, um, the denomination I belong to has the right doctrine. But I saw in Toronto, I saw everything you could think of, Catholics, Presbyterians, Baptists, all coming up and getting prayed for, falling down, getting drunk in the Holy Ghost, getting filled with the Spirit, crying, shaking, they were getting filled with the Spirit. And you know what? Many of them didn't even speak in tongues yet. And that, that blew up my doctrine because basic Pentecostal doctrine says, first you speak in tongues, then you can do all the other stuff. I said, God, is this right? Here these Catholics are, you know, and they don't even speak in tongues. Is this right? And that scripture rose up in my heart. He'll pour out his Spirit upon all flesh. Now, I used to think it said all Pentecostals. I had to go back and read it. But it said all flesh. Well, when God looks down, he doesn't see one right group and one wrong group. He sees his children. And I find this. You know what I find this? That God won't talk to me about John. If I go to God and say, God, you know, John did this and he did this and he said this mean thing and he's doing this. You know what God says about John? He just smiles and says, that's my boy. <laughs> but he'll talk to me about me. God sees one family, one body. And the way we come in unity is not going to be by doctrine. It ain't going to happen until we get to heaven. We're going to come into unity by our love and our passion for Jesus. Well, he began to deal with me about other members and this, just a judgmental attitude, thinking that, that I was the right one, that I had all the answers. And I didn't realize that I was that way. And um, this one night in Toronto, there's this lady in front of me that's worshiping Jesus, she was about 6'2", she was tall, had these long arms, and she was worshiping, and she had a piece of Christmas garland in her hand as she's worshiping, and she's waving this garland back and forth. Now, for some reason, it was really bugging me. <laughs> I don't know why. I mean, it's this big deal, but it was bugging me. Now, normally, if someone did something during worship and it distracted me or bothered me, I just looked the other way or closed my eyes, but her hands were right in my view of the overhead. And it was new music to me. It was songs I wasn't familiar with. I didn't know them well enough to close my eyes and sing. And so, you know, for me to sing, I had to read the overhead. But at the same time, she's waving this thing back and forth, and it's bugging me. 
Now, all around me is anointed worship, people passionately loving Jesus. Everybody's flowing in worship except for me. I'm flowing in judgment. And you know, it's hard to worship Jesus when you're judging your brother. It really is. And I almost, I, I can't believe I even thought about this, and I'm so glad I didn't do it, but I almost tapped her on the shoulder and said, would you stop doing that? But I didn't do that. Thank you, Jesus, I didn't do that. But for one second, see, this is the fire of God. Sometimes God lets things happen that bug you. And what he was doing was he was bringing this impurity to the surface. Right in the middle of a worship service, there was such contrast there that this impurity was rising up right in the middle of the worship service. Why? He wanted to rip it out of there where it was gone. And for one second, I took my eyes off of this piece of Christmas garland and I looked at her face and there's these tears running down her face and I hear these words on the inside of me, she loves me. And I instantly just broke and began to weep. I said, God, forgive me. Here I am judging one of your daughters and all she's doing is loving you. You know, but I found that I'm not the only person that does that. You know, when that lady came and, and poured that perfume on Jesus' feet and began to wash, kiss his feet and wash his feet with her hair, you know what? The disciples didn't go, hey, yeah, let's do that too. You know what they did? They said, <clears throat> <clears throat> Jesus, no, we shouldn't do that. That's excessive. You know, we could have sold that and given that to the poor. You know why they said that? They didn't care about the poor. You know why they said that? Because she was being more intimate with Jesus than they had ever been. And they were judging her. She loves me, the Lord said. And I just began to repent. I said, God, forgive me. Now, I believe that pastors ha have a responsibility to lead people into worship and worship leaders. And there's different styles. You know, we go to a different church every weekend. Different kind of church. The worship is one way at one. I don't think we've been to one church where it's the same everywhere. It's different styles and different ways. You know, but everywhere that, that we go, I can get into the worship. And so churches have different styles, different personalities, different way to worship. But we can't be so inflexible that, that we can't worship with another group that's a little bit different than us. Why? Because we're all going to be in heaven together. And if you don't like banners and Christmas garland, you're going to live next to someone that does. Because <laughs> I don't think they have angels, you know, checking all the banners at the door. I don't think so. Maybe they do. I don't know. But I do know this. That we, that we need to get along with one another. We need to love one another. And we need to stop judging one another. Because it's hard to flow in revival when you're judging others. Even just some, maybe someone's shaking and you think, well, that looks weird, that, that person's shaking on the ground. People get nervous when someone starts shaking. In the book of Acts, the whole building shook. If the building shakes, you're going to shake, honey. whether you want to or whether you don't, if you're in the building. Amen? But if we want to be flowing in a revival, we want to lead our kids in revival, we need to be in revival ourselves. I've got a lot of other steps on doing that, and I'm just going to, in my workshop when I'm teaching, I'm just going to pick up right here uh, in the afternoon where we left off. Brother Van? <clears throat> I love this guy because he's willing to share his heart and you know it's the transparency that the children see that causes their lives to be changed and the children see your heart God's children today see it too so we thank you amen <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen we will break for lunch we'll reconvene here at the hour of uh, 1 30
130.